In a world increasingly shaped by ideological extremes, the term cult has become a potent weapon wielded in cultural, religious, and political battlegrounds. But what happens when the hunters become the hunted? Welcome to Cult Busting the Cult Busters, a thought-provoking documentary that turns the lens on those who label, judge, and dismantle groups they define as cults. We will deep into the controversial and often secretive operations of cult busters, individuals, and organizations devoted to exposing what they perceive as dangerous cults. These crusaders arm themselves with allegations and accusations, but what guides their judgment? And who holds them accountable? Grace Road Church has been called a cult because of the level of control it exerts over its members. They beat their followers to get the devil spirit away from their body. In the Grace Road Church's view of the world, we are heading for an impending global cataclysm that will involve nuclear war. It's written that I must warn the wicked. The leader of the group convinced her followers to move to Fiji. Grace Road says it's building heaven on earth. Once they got into Fiji, the leaders took their passports away and their phones away so they can't keep in touch with their families in Korea. This cult that started out in Korea somehow became an incredibly politically and economically powerful force in Fiji. Grace Road is enriching the community here. Through interviews with experts and insiders, we unravel the complex motivations that fuel these anti-cult movements. From genuine concern to personal vendettas, from protective instincts to power struggles, the forces driving cult busters are as varied as they are compelling. There are many cults in the world, the most infamous found in America, which have made headline news for their violent, abusive, reclusive, and suicidal tendencies. Some infamous American cults include the Branch Davidians, the People's Temple, Heaven's Gate, and Children of God. News reports describe these so-called cults as being extreme and dangerous, but what exactly is the difference between a doomsday cult like the Branch Davidians and a mainstream religion like Christianity? Some say that there is no difference between a cult and religion. Differences for some may be in the number of followers that each has. Not to forget many religions are made up of many smaller sects which are no different than so-called cults. This is a fairly ambiguous claim, that cults are made up of hundreds of people, while religions are made up of millions, while it disregards the other factors that distinguish a so-called cult from a religion. Is it possible to eventually heal everything? And the answer is yes. This is Serge Benhayen, the leader of Universal Medicine, a controversial group selling unproven healing treatments to desperate people. Have you ever said that you're the reincarnation of Leonardo da Vinci? Yes, I did. Serge claims he's the chosen one of God, the latest in a long line of great thinkers. All of the great figures, people like Zoroaster, Plato, Buddha, Jesus, are all sort of crystallized in the Serge ben -Hayen. I'll just go ahead and talk about some of his mad ideas, if you like. Cult busting the cult busters also questions the impact of these interventions. Are lives being saved, or are different beliefs simply being suppressed? Is this a necessary safeguard against manipulation and abuse, or a new form of cultural imperialism? For example, there are many groups such as the Hebrew Israelites. Under so-called cult leader Yahweh bin Yahweh, the Nation of Islam, through Elijah Muhammad, Marcus Garvey, and the UNI, Dr. York, and the United Nawabia Nation of Moors, including Noble Drew Ali, and the Moorish Science Temple of America who have been persecuted for namesake. As we journey from the infamous tragedies that galvanized the anti-cult movement to the modern-day skirmishes in new religious landscapes, we invite viewers to look beyond the headlines and soundbites. Join us in exploring the gray areas and moral ambiguities that define the battle between cults and their challengers. Are these challengers working under the guide of righteousness, or is this an ego-driven battle of beliefs to oppress others and their beliefs? faiths, and cultures? Are we witnessing a necessary fight for safety and sanity, or a dangerous game of ideological enforcement? Discover the answers in Cult Busting the Cult Busters, where nothing is as simple as it seems. Join us as we set the stage for a deep dive into the paradoxes and complexities of the anti-cult world, 
inviting viewers to challenge their preconceptions and consider the nuanced realities of what it means to define, defend against, or dismantle a cult. People are drawn to rural Georgia for its peace and quiet beauty. What follows is a story about a group of people who came to do our own thing, as one man put it. What their thing is, is a little complicated and more than a little unnerving to some of their neighbors in Putnam County, which is about 70 miles southwest of Atlanta. Fox 5's Doug Richards joins us now with more on who they are and the biggest question surrounding these folks. Doug? Amanda, this group is probably located about 50 miles south of Athens. It's a group that has published files, piles of newsletters and writes favorably about bits and pieces of all the world's major religions. Yet its members say they are non-religious, a fraternal order, like the Shriners. The group's leader is described as more than a teacher. He is the supreme grand master and happens to be from another planet. The Eatonton-based group has several names, the Nation of Nawabian Moors, the Ancient Mystic Order of Machilzadek. It all fits enough of a pattern that it has some Putnam Countyans nervously asking, is this group a cult? 70 miles southeast of Atlanta, Eatonton is the seat of Putnam County, best known as the dairy capital of Georgia. Oh, they got 400 and something acres goes up to that corner, young. William Larman is a dairyman, and he's talking about his new neighbors. Oh, yeah, I'm happy for them. But they are not dairymen. Because they said they come from what? Rich. Planet Rich, I think. <laughs> it is not a joke to the people who've built these two large pyramids and elaborate Egyptian-style ornamentation and put up rows of double-wide homes on some 400 acres of rural Putnam County farmland and woodland. How many people live here? You got different families live here. It's a place that granted our request for a visit inside the secured gate, allowed us to watch the workers build new ceremonial structures, allowed us to listen close up to the continuous chant broadcast from a speaker bank at the top of one of the pyramids. For our people that want to get spiritually in tune with the, with the, you know, understand. But for the most part, sidestepped our requests for answers. But what about the guy from another planet? Or... We'll make sure you get all yeah, of those people with them by daddy. Are they a cult? Depends on the definition of a cult. Certainly there are, are, are many characteristics similar with other uh, entities that are uh, defined as cults. How long you lived here? About six, seven months. Jerry, our tour guide, says he came here from Alabama. The sheriff says most of the other residents come from the Northeast, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. How many, including how many children, is unclear. He's Yanun. He's known by many names. The group's leader is identified in literature as Malachi Zodok York, the Supreme Grand Master. He is described as a charismatic speaker and apparently a prolific writer, producing monthly newsletters and dozens of books. He says that he is from the eighth planet in the 19th gal galaxy of Iliwun. A universe far outside of this one? Does it make sense to you? That's in the book. If he wrote it, then, yeah. We're from Orion. Dr. York is from Risk. He's from, he's from Orion. What's the deal? It's nothing, it's nothing strange. It's just new to the public. The vast majority of cults are started by an individual who's extremely charismatic, who's very confident, uh, very uh, commanding, in some cases, very demanding, expects an awful lot of the followers. So this is the compound nightclub? <laughs> no, it's not a compound. Oh, it's not a compound? I'm sorry. <laughs> not at all. The centerpiece of the Putnam County property is a nightclub the group opened in October. At midday, it was in high decibel preparation for an upcoming party. Outside, there were parked three stretch limousines. Oh, it's an Egyptian theme park. This is a theme park? An Egyptian theme park. Now, there's some people who think this is a cult. Well, there's two ways to look at it. We don't happen to have a religious belief. You follow what I'm saying? Now, on the other hand, culture, cult, culture, that's a connect, there's a connection there. So if you say we're a cult in the sense of we found a culture, that works for us, yeah. Are they dangerous? I have no information uh, to indicate that they are dangerous. What they are is a roadside curiosity to native Putnam Countyans and to the folks inside the gate, a community with children and entertainment and an Egyptian theme and a leader they call Grandmaster who writes that he's from another planet. Maybe the spaceship come in here and I could get away with him. <laughs> you see all that we're building out there? Yeah. Does it look like we're going anywhere soon to you? 
this Lee building is so beautiful out there. It's a beautiful, peaceful environment where we, in, we invite any nationality, any race to come out and visit. Though they declined my request for a formal interview, the Nawabian nation of Moors does have a curious history of openness. Each summer it has an open house. The sheriff says the open house draws thousands of people to the Putnam County property, clogging the roads, folks from all over the world, coming to visit relatives and to hear from the Supreme Grand Master. Not surprisingly, the group also has a website, uh, an ever-evolving website. How large a, a following do they have? I mean, how many people are there at that compound? Well, it's really hard to tell. The sheriff estimates it's more than 100, but he says that there are also lots of people that actually live in the community in Putnam County who don't actually live on the property but go to the property regularly to hear the Supreme Grand Master and uh, go to the nightclub, presumably, and whatever the else. The nightclub, open to the public? Regular party that's what, atmosphere? That's what they say, and they serve uh, liquor, and they say no drugs are allowed. Hmm, interesting. Putnam County. Doug, thank you. Thanks. The term cult conjures images of blind followers, charismatic leaders, and sinister practices. Yet, its origins tell a different story, one entwined with culture, a term that speaks to the customs, arts, social institutions, and achievements of a particular nation, people, or other social group. The word cult originally comes from the Latin cultus, which simply means care or adoration. It's closely related to culture, which encompasses the ideas, customs, and social behaviors of a society. Despite its neutral roots, the modern interpretation of cult has evolved dramatically, often embodying negative connotations. This shift in meaning has not occurred in a vacuum. It has been shaped by media, popular culture, and, notably, cult-busting groups. Have blacks pledging to them, when in actuality, the first Freemason was Nimrod, son of Kush, Ethiopian, and we, they should be getting their charters from us. So I'm barely here to set the record straight. And I think it's time for Freemasons, I think it's time for us to come forward because we're getting a bad name because of things that Caucasian Masons are doing, like Albert Pike and Albert Mackey and them, with their books, Moral Dogma, where they give praise to Lucifer. And now Freemasons worldwide, they're being thought of as Satanic and all that. And I think it's time for us to step up and let people know what we're allowed to let them know about our fraternity, right, but to set the record straight. You know, you know what I'm saying? Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, how do you think the rest of the world views us with your new title as well? Well, I think that, um, first of all, it smashes the cult concept. Uh, as Freemasons and Shriners, we were trying not to make that public. But because we kept getting slapped in the face with cult this, cult that, cult that, then we had to say, as you can see, it says Nuwapian Grand Lodge. Okay. It's not just a chapter, it's a Grand Lodge, right? And our temples are going to spread across the country. Mm -hmm. And so it's now, in other words, time for us to come forward and let people know that the, the, the slander mm -hmm. that they keep saying that the cult is a cult that, unless all Freemasons worldwide are a cult, then we're not a cult. Okay. You follow the Can you tell me what's the difference between a Grand Lodge and a chapter? Uh, yeah, a grand lodge is more like saying a mother or father lodge, and beneath it you can have different chapters or uh, different, uh, they have numbers, literally, you know what I'm saying? And these numbers will designate a certain, have a name over, like the Amos Lodge in um, Macon, Georgia, or the uh, Enoch Lodge in New York, or the King Solomon Lodge, etc. And, but they'll have a grand lodge above that, which issues charters to subsidiaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, black people seem a bit concerned. Cult busters have positioned themselves as unlicensed defenders of public safety, often highlighting extreme cases as representative of all spiritual or communal groups outside the mainstream. But the reality is more nuanced. Many groups labeled as cults are simply practicing alternative beliefs or lifestyles. The diversity within these groups is immense, ranging from spiritual and religious communities to New Age practitioners. Over the years, the actions of cult busters have drawn attention not just from the public, but also from law enforcement, corporations, and political groups. These entities have recognized the utility of cult busters in enforcing mainstream cultural conformity and suppressing alternative beliefs. Reporting on them. So, you know, there's a lot of fear, uh, there's a lot of caution.
What we could see by interviewing people and looking through the documents is that this church has been so successful because of the level of control it has over the lives of its members. When they join, members typically will sell their family's assets. They would hand over, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes worth of their worldly possessions. They would be given shareholdings in these companies and they would receive investor visas that would give them the right to stay in Fiji. The church members work like six days a week and they sleep like four or five hours a day. On paper, many of them are shareholders, but in reality, they work without pay. So it was quite an ingenious system that Grace Road was using. The picture of life in the Grace Road Church. We've seen instances where cult busters are brought in to provide expertise but there's a fine line between genuine concern and suppressing dissenting views. Indeed, the recruitment of cult busters by powerful groups raises questions about the true motivations behind these alliances. Are they genuinely protecting individuals, or are they tools for cultural and religious hegemony? In some cases, labeling a group as a cult serves to undermine and delegitimize political opponents. It's a strategy that's been used globally, turning beliefs into threats. While some so-called cults indeed share similar, eschatological beliefs with mainstream religions, for example, some cults within Christianity may predict apocalyptic events, there are stark contrasts in how these beliefs shape behavior. Take the Heaven's Gate cult, which posited that the earth would be recycled, and that their only chance of survival was to commit suicide to join an alien spacecraft. This idea might seem as extreme as Christian prophecies involving the four horsemen and a resurrection during the apocalypse. However, what sets Heaven's Gate apart is not just its apocalyptic vision, but the lethal urgency of self-destruction imparted by its leader. This leader not only propagated an extreme outcome, but also manipulated followers into a mass suicide to escape it. This highlights another key distinction between how criminal groups act and how cults and religions act. So-called cults often revolve around a messianic leader who employs inspiration, not manipulation and coercion, wielding significant personal charisma to maintain control and to lead others to self-destruction with a charge to commit criminal acts. There are many leaders who are falsely persecuted for this very reason. There is a great distinction between these criminal groups of organized crime and actual religions, traditions of faith, and cultures outside of the mainstream. Despite the fact Daniel Kim, uh, the son of Ok Choo Shin, being a wanted man in Korea, he was at ribbon-cutting ceremonies with the prime minister. Despite the abuse of its members, despite the fact that people are forced to work without money, what we found was that they've essentially been given a pass because they've just become so essential to the Fijian economy that earns them some protection just by itself. We reached out for comment to the Prime Minister, the Attorney General, the Fiji Development Bank. We reached out to Grace Road Church. No one responded to us at all. The only thing closest to a response was after we published and when the Attorney General was asked by a journalist, he said he doesn't think we're credible. So he's just simply plucking out uh, some report written by some organisation who we've never heard about before. Fiji has elected a new leader after almost 16 years. Now Fiji has a new government. They called for an inquiry into Grace Road Church. We don't know what's going to happen in the future with the Grace Road Church. We simply expose what's happening uh, and hope that people make the right decisions. This manipulation of the term cult as a weapon against challengers not only stifles diversity but also infringes on the freedom to express different cultural, religious, and social identities. All people are the same. Our only distinction is simply a community living differently. Most religions and so-called cult practices are peaceful, but the label cult invites fear, suspicion, eventually intervention by law enforcement, and for some even face entrapment or malicious persecution because of their unique beliefs. As we delve deeper into the controversies surrounding cult busters, it becomes clear that the battle is not just over beliefs, but over the very right to differ from the norm. Diversity in belief and practice is vital for a healthy society. When we allow fear and racial differences to dictate which cultures are acceptable, we risk erasing unique perspectives that contribute to our collective human experience. 
Busting the Cult Busters challenges viewers to rethink the narratives we've been taught about cults and cultism, urging a closer examination of who benefits from these narratives and at what cost. As we conclude, the question remains. Who watches the Watchmen, and what are the consequences when the Guardians themselves are not held accountable? We have explored the misuse of the term cult and the complex dynamics involving cult busters, offering a critical lens on how cultural definitions and differences are managed in society. As our journey through the shadowed realms of cult busting draws to a close, we are left with profound questions about the role these groups play in shaping societal norms and beliefs. The evidence suggests that cult busters, often seen as defenders of societal safety, can also become instigators of contention and division within the very cultures, societies, and religious organizations they target. It has been stated by Catholics.com that the, the word cult has fallen on hard times. Used authentically, it refers to a grouping of people for some religious purpose. It can also refer to specific ceremonial, liturgical, and prayer activities carried out within a particular group. Vatican II, for example, refers to the cult of the saints, meaning the honor and devotion Christians show to Christians who are now reigning with Christ in heaven. Used this way, cult carries no pejorative connotations. In the last few decades, an unfortunate phenomenon has sprung up, primarily among evangelical Protestants who have appropriated the word and used it to categorize religious groups with whom they disagree. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses have become cultists, and their religions are branded as cults. In popular jargon, cult implies more than just a religion with odd tenets. It carries the implication that the group has a hidden agenda, uses deception and mind control techniques to keep its members in line and may be satanic in origin. Calling someone a cultist has become a handy stick with which to beat members of minority religions. Some fundamentalists call the Catholic Church a cult. How he was received and how he was, and how he was treated. You follow? So it may not have touched you as much as it touched me. You follow that? But I followed the whole history straight on through. Name by name, person by person, every event. I know know why educated Frenchmen had to use Africans as they call us to translate for them. 
I wanted to know why if I was in Virginia and I was supposed to be but dumb, did you need me to take you all through this country and show you to find the waterways? If I was restricted from slavery to uh, or confined as a slave in a certain environment, how did Ben York know all about the country? How did Ben York speak every dialect of every Native American tribe here? How did Ben York have children amongst the Osage, the Mandan, the Seminole, the Shinnecock, the Shoshone? How did he manage to have um, children amongst every one of these tribes? And anytime you see anybody who's a Nisphere, and they write this in their own books, Nisphere means nose pierced. Sound familiar, Ansars? It was a symbol of the descendants of Ben York who were black Native Americans. And to this very day, they still exist. It's just about waiting for the key moment when, the, when nature will realign itself and make a way for us not to be as abusive to them as they were to us. My forte is, give me what's mine. That's all. And just leave me alone. If you can't live with me in peace, then leave me alone. If we can't get along, you leave me alone. I can survive without you. I survived here before you got here. You follow what I'm saying? Meanwhile, the paperwork is in Geneva. And the telegram came back that it's already been approved because they can't disapprove it. That's why you got that little newspaper in your hand. That newspaper to put the family chart out there so you know what you're talking about. And the next newspaper will have a little more information. And each newspaper is going to have a little more information. It's free. Take it. Study it. And be able to defend yourself. You follow? You know, there's a... One more thing. You know, there's a big uh, cult, a tremendous cult with thousands of cult members in Atlanta right now? Did y'all know that? Yeah. They are taking over Atlanta. This, this cult right here, See this cult? <laughs> this cult, they're called the, uh, the ancient Arabic order of the noble mystic shrine. This cult. There's thousands of them all over Atlanta right now. I'm saying that because we're registered in the state of Georgia as a fraternity and they refer to us as a cult. So the shrine is a fraternity and they wear feathers with crescents and stars on it and they say assalamu alaikum and they wear Arab clothes and they identify with Arabia and Fez in Morocco. So they also must be a cult. Now I'll tell you the truth. Cult busters are bored because the 60s are gone. And they built offices and they used to go around kidnapping people who were joining the Hare Krishnas and different groups and hold them in rooms and detox them with their philosophy of Christianity. Now they're bored. So they have nobody else, so they're going to now turn on fraternities and start saying fraternities are cults. That's what cult busters have to do in order to keep their rent paid. They become the, the vicars of the Middle Ages who went out looking for witches. And when they ran out of what they thought were witches, anybody who said something that sound witchy, they tarred and feathered them or burnt them. They had a dad to see to float a piece of wood in the water and then put the witch on it. And if the wood sunk, she was a witch. You understand? Then they took out and burnt her on a, at a stake. That's the day and time you're getting into now. That's how insecure people are becoming because you're fed up. And they want you to react like Farrakhan. They want us to run over to Olivia and align ourselves with some fanatic terrorist fool like Gaddafi. I know and you know something that they don't seem to recognize. If Farrakhan has been recently accepted by the Muslim world, correct? I know and you know that's crap. We know it because one of the schools in our fraternity and sorority is the study of Islam. That's one of the degrees we study. Thoroughly in Arabic. Am I right? Now, Farrakhan believes Allah is a man who came in the year 1930 named W.D. Farad, a human being. The Muslim world believes Allah is ghaybi, as they say in Arabic, unseen, conflict. The Muslim world believes the last prophet was a man named Mustafa Muhammad Al Amin, who died in the year 632 in Arabia. Farrakhan believes that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the final messenger and the Muhammad of their Quran of 1400 years ago. Conflict. Muslims fast Ramadan, the season changes. Farrakhan's followers fast Ramadan in December. 
conflict. Muslims prostrate in prayer. Farrakhan scholars stand up in prayer. Conflict. The beard in Islam is called Sunnah. Muslims must wear it. The nation of Islam does not wear it. Conflict. You understand what I'm saying? There's no way the Arab world could accept Farrakhan as an imam or their brother without some underhanded, slimy con game going on. But America, basic America, sees the word Mohammedan or Muslim and don't have a clue because they don't bother studying other things because their Christian ministers are so intimidated by the possibility that their congregation might find the truth. They'd say, don't read that, don't read that. Those are heathens, those are blasphemers. They got all these screens and they're closing the minds of people. And now when something like that happens, the general public cannot see there's something going on. Something for us to worry about. I'm gonna tell you why it's something for us to worry about. Because when word of D. Muhammad, the son of Elijah Muhammad, defected from the nation of Islam and formed this world community and joined them in with the Arab world, you know what he did? He took thousands of black Americans and gave them into the hands of a new breed of communism or terrorism called Islam. Now we can't tell where the bombs are coming from. Because the word cult is derived from the Latin cultus, which is the worship rendered to God and the veneration of the saints. The meaning of culture is derived from it. All cultures are based on some religion, at least in the beginning, whether Catholic, pagan, bizarre, or extreme forms such as the Aztecs with human sacrifice or others. But this is not the definition of a cult as it has come to be known today. Even cultures that claim to not have a basis in a religion religiously enforce this belief. In fact, the willful disassociation from religion itself is a form of religion in that it is the underlying motivation for all of the society's activity and organization, and this, then, is what those loyal to the renunciation of religion place their trust and faith in. Their god is their belly, if not materialism per se, or something akin to it. Atheists are very religious, they rigorously place their faith in there being no God, a belief that takes more faith, so to speak, than actually believing in God, simply because to deny God's existence is a formidable task since evidence of God's creation is all around. Simply put, the atheist has to deny reality in order to claim that it is he who is the realist. Cults, as we use the term here, are bodies of variant religious groups like Protestantism, but not necessarily the hippie commune type popularized in the 1960s that broke off from sex and are formed from the ideas of the founder or spiritual leader. Usually these splinter groups are based on the leader's imaginative or unusual interpretation or of their own Bible, which was previously altered to suit the preferences of the current or former sect and the sacred text before this. While the cults of the Protestant kind of recognize Jesus Christ, he may or not be thought to be divine and or not a member of the Trinity, if there is a Trinity belief. End times doctrine that are extreme, are usually quite specific in contradiction to the words of the Bible and Christ himself and are very important, even central to the system of dogma the believers may follow. Sacraments tend to have less of a role than they do in sex and mainstream religions. All dogmatic religions and so-called cults in general train their lay adherents to evangelize, some more strenuously than others. One of the methods of acquiring converts is to take advantage of persons who have suffered a traumatic event and may be particularly vulnerable, less able to resist the lure of a promise of happiness along with sympathy from fellowshipping cult members. Another tactic is financial incentive, which takes various forms from aid to promises of gain, power, and even superstardom, which is what occurred in the encounter the Lords had with the Adventist. A more subtle and increasingly used method of winning over Catholics is to invite them to simply pray with the group or to merely study the Bible. Catholics are told that they can still remain Catholics, but come to their meetings and study groups. Of course, any Catholic who believes this is already ignorant enough can be persuaded eventually that the Catholic Church is a false religion. This kind of dogma has been inoculated against the Catholic faith and all others, whole and entire, within his own, novice ordo parish, by some poor, ignorant priest who teaches that universal salvation is de facto if not de jure. system and we are on the outside of that system and this is why we keep blaming everybody for everything that happens to us 
because we're on the outside. We won't get involved. I'm not telling you to become no politician. I don't care what party you vote for, Democrat or Republican, it's your business. But know the law that you live under. So you know your rights if you are going to subscribe to that principle. But we as Native Americans, indigenous people of this land, whether you call yourself a Nubian or a Hebrew or a Muslim, all those are religious, nice, quick names. When you go down to your nationality, you follow? It is important for you to investigate every time that word is used. If they say more, morenos, negra, whatever term they use when they're writing that record, you should be studying that because it applies to you. And you find out that most of the things that happen to you, you let happen because you don't know the law. You follow what I'm saying? So you are entitled to a third article judge if you acknowledge yourself as not a 13 but a 14 amendment person. If you're a 13 amendment person, you fall, you keep using that 13th amendment gave me my right. The right you're talking about is the Emancipation Proclamation for the freeing of slaves. Hello? Hello? No Slavics in here. No slaves. So the 13th amendment does not apply, apply to you. Abraham Lincoln was under pressure. That's why he signed it from foreign governments that was going to attack him because of their moors, because of the Malians that was in the country that were not supposed to be taken into bondage. And if you read the documents, you will find those articles that had a group of people called the Watchmen. Mm -hmm. The Watchmen broke off from the police department. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. What did it sound like? A new prime military group military. that breaks away from the police department and does their own law? Militia. Not militia. Militia, believe it or not, is legal. And I'll talk to you about it if you bring it up again. Huh? Red Dogs. These new, uh, okay, a uh, SWAT. SWAT team. Red Dogs. Yeah. Listen. The police watching. I'm going to name something. All right? What is alcohol? SWAT. An intoxin substance or medicine used for cure, an ethic substance. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. A G F. What does that abbreviate? Alright. Why, if there's a hold up at a convenience store, is the ATF there? Are they there to count the amount of alcohol that's being stolen? Are they there because someone got a firearm in fact when it's legal? Why are they there? Because they are a paramilitary group. Put up a fake society that goes off and does things that the government can apologize for. Like Waco. They say, oh, wow. They said, oh, we got misinformation. We heard, go ahead and burn the place up. And someone said, go ahead and go home. Forget it. But we didn't hear that. You know what Janet Reno was saying? We didn't hear that? They, uh, yeah. She sent the word down to burn the people up when the word was really go home and forget it. It's just a religious group. And like I said last night, if they're a religious group, they're separate from state. So David Koresh can call himself anything he wants. He can call himself an ice cream sandwich. That is his prerogative if he's a religious person. It's only when you, it has nothing to do with state. So these groups are set up to try to cause chaos, to intimidate. But if you recognize or fall under that 13th Amendment or under their laws, then you are subject to that abuse. If not, you fall under a group of people called Moors, French Moor, Morenos. You follow that? This is being used simply because it's on paper, it's on treaties, it's on documents. Morocco, Mauritania, the French version of it and the Latin word of it. You follow? Let's set the record straight. Make that your first Bible. I don't mean in a religious kind of sense. Read this book and really get into what I'm saying. And go back and read that blue book and Constitution and study it the way you study books that you like when you want to go out and bust people up and look heavy. This is that book? <laughs> this book here is another level of information for you. Throughout history, the mechanisms of cult busting, a modern day term, for witch hunting have not only been employed by independent activists, but have also been harnessed by institutions of immense power, churches, police forces, even intelligence agencies like the CIA and FBI. This alliance between cult busters and tactical black operation forces reveals a disturbing pattern of using fear of the other to control and suppress unique cultures and dissenting views.
May we burn her? Burn her! Burn her! Who do you know she is a witch? She looks like one! Yeah, 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 yeah. Bring her forward. I'm not a witch. I'm not a witch. But you are dressed as one. They dressed me up like this. <laughs> and this isn't my nose. It's a false one. Will? Well, we did do the nose. The nose? And the hat. But she's a witch. Yeah. 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 Did you dress her up like this? No. 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 Yes. 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 Yeah. A bit. Yeah. A bit. A bit. A bit. She has got a wart. <laughs> what makes you think she is a witch? Well, she turned me into a newt. A newt. We got better. Burn her anyway. Burn! There are ways of telling whether she is a witch. Are there? Oh, what are they? Tell us! Tell me, what do you do with witches? Burn her in And what do you burn apart from witches? More witches! Wood! So, why do witches burn? Because I made of wood. Good! Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, how do we tell whether she is made of wood? Build a bridge out of her. Ah, but can you not also make bridges out of stone? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah cool. uh, uh, does a wood sink in water? No, no. no it floats. It floats. Throw her into the pond. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what also floats in water? Bread. Apples. Uh, very small rocks. Cider. A great gravy. Cherries. Mud. A churches. Churches. Lead. Lead. A duck. <sighs> exactly. So, logically, if she weighs the same as a duck, she's made of wood. And therefore... A witch! A witch! A witch! A witch! A witch! But we shall use my larger scales. Right, remove the supports. Who are you who are so wise in the ways of science? I am Arthur, King of the Britons. My liege. Good tonight. Will you come with me to Camelot and join us at the round table? My liege, I would be honored. What is your name? Bedivere, my liege. Then I dub you. Sir Bedivere, Knight of the Round Table. The wise Sir Bedivere was the first to join King Arthur's knights. But I... Indeed, the roots of cult busting stretch back to darker times, even to the slave era in America, where it served as a tool of oppression. Many slaves were forced to abandon their ancient cultures and religions or face dreadful consequences. This historical context sheds light on how cult busting has been used to enforce conformity and suppress diversity throughout the ages. The patterns we see today are not new. They are the continuation of a long history of cultural domination, where the powerful dictate acceptable beliefs and practices, often under the guise of protection and moral superiority. As we reflect on these revelations, it becomes imperative to question the current narrative surrounding cults and cult busters. Are we protecting communities, 
or are we perpetuating a cycle of cultural domination and fear? This documentary does not just challenge us to rethink cult busting. It invites us to consider a broader vision of human coexistence, one where differences are not just tolerated but valued, where fear is replaced by curiosity, and where suppression is overcome by dialogue and respect. In a world rich with diversity, understanding is the bridge and respect is the builder. Let us choose to build rather than to destroy. This ties together the themes, offering a poignant reflection on the role of cult busting in history and its implications for society today. It calls for a reconsideration of how we define and interact with cultural and religious differences, promoting a future based on mutual respect and understanding.